This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. We continue to expect that the economy will expand at a moderate pace over the next few years. With the economy on solid footing, the Federal Reserve raises interest rates, sending the Dow to another record close. The clock is ticking. Health insurers will soon have to submit rate requests for next year. But there's a lot of uncertainty, and patients are left waiting and wondering. High-tech security, CT scans aren't just for hospitals. You may soon find them at airports as well. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Wednesday, June 14th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sue Herrera. Tyler Matheson is off tonight. The Federal Reserve did something today that will affect your money. It raised interest rates for just the fourth time since the end of 2015. The decision by the central bank signals confidence in the economy. A healthy economy is believed to be able to withstand an increase in borrowing costs. But the hike came despite a double whammy of weak economic reports today. Retail sales recorded their biggest drop in 16 months, suggesting consumers remain cautious. And consumer prices fell unexpectedly last month. And it's data on prices and inflation that the Federal Reserve is watching closely. Kate Rogers has more. The Federal Reserve raising rates for the second time this year because the economy looks stronger. The Fed hiking the target range for the federal funds rate by a quarter point to between one and one and a quarter percent. Fed Chair Janet Yellen citing strength in the U.S. economy and the labor market. Our decision to make another gradual reduction in the amount of policy accommodation reflects the progress the economy has made and is expected to make toward maximum employment and price stability objectives assigned to us by law. The Fed's forecast suggests it may hike one more time this year for a total of three increases. The rate hikes could mean higher monthly payments for credit card users and people with home equity lines of credit or adjustable rate mortgages. The Fed was looking for inflation at about 2% this year, but now believes inflation will be a little less than that. The Fed also announcing a detailed plan to wind down its balance sheet this year, selling off some of the assets the central bank bought to stabilize the economy during the financial crisis. Right now, the Fed is sitting on more than $4 trillion. We currently expect to begin implementing a balance sheet normalization program this year. Consistent with the principles and plans we released in 2014, this program would gradually decrease our reinvestments and initiate a gradual and largely predictable decline in our securities holdings. Chair Yellen also addressed questions about her own future with the Federal Reserve. As reports have surfaced, the Trump administration is looking for a potential successor. What I've said about my own situation is that I fully intend to serve out um, my term as chair, which ends in early February. Um, I have not had conversations with the president about uh, future plans. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers. The market reaction to the Fed was choppy and somewhat muted. That response is something that many would have considered unusual years ago, but a lot has changed since the Fed last embarked on a cycle of interest rate hikes. Today, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 46 points to 21,374. That's a record. The Nasdaq lost 25. The S&P 500 was off, too. As for oil, prices settled at a seven-month low on concerns that the global glut isn't going anywhere. And it was crude and today's two week economic reports, in addition to the Fed, that investors were focused on. Bob Pisani has that part of the market story. May's CPI fell 0.1%, with year over year gains down 1.9%. Gasoline prices also fell roughly 6%. Now, not surprisingly, that drop in gasoline prices weighed on May retail sales. It fell 0.3%, that's compared to April, below expectations that sales would be flat. But there may not be a cause for alarm just yet. Broader retail trends are still very much intact. So for example, home improvement is continuing to do well, e-commerce is continuing to do well, and gain at the expense of department stores. Consumer electronic sales are notoriously volatile, so that might explain that. And by the way, April retail sales, April, were revised upward. So the markets also turned lower on the weekly oil inventory report, which showed a smaller than expected drawdown in crude inventories. Oil promptly sank below $45. That's the lowest level since November. 
So here's the good news. After two down days on Friday and Monday, the tech sell-off has abated. It's basically gone away. And with that, I think the odds of a broader market correction for the moment appear to have abated as well. Here's the bad news. The choppy economic data and the stubborn refusal of inflation to rise toward the Fed's target is making the Fed's job a little bit more difficult. But keep this in mind. Cheap oil has been a huge factor in the inflation and retail sales equation. But lower oil is good for the consumer. So we shouldn't be rooting for higher oil just to satisfy some inflation target that the Federal Reserve has. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. Christina Hooper is here with us now for more on the Fed, the economy, and the stock market. She's the global strategist at Invesco. Welcome, Christina. Good to see you. Great to see you. Let's start with the Fed, and then we'll work our way into the economy. This was pretty much, as I recall, what you were forecasting, correct? That's correct. We expected a rate hike. We also expected that we would get more information on balance sheet normalization, which is really um, the 800-pound gorilla. Yeah, that's what the Fed has on its balance sheet that it's trying to taper. It's trying to, you know, put back into the market, right? Sure. We saw this historic increase in the Fed's balance sheet through what was called QE1, QE2, and QE3. And there was always this question mark about how exactly will the Fed get back to normal? And we're starting to get some pretty significant details on that plan. What about the economy? Because, as I mentioned in my introduction to Bob Pisani's piece, the Fed watches inflation very closely, and it watches the economy and the economic stats very closely. And we got two reports today that were certainly less than what the street was hoping for. Certainly. Um, I think what we need to do is take a step back, down, though, and look at trends. Now, um, with inflation, we've had a few months now of, of lower inflation. But there are some reasons for it, including um, one, of, one of the drivers of lower inflation was lower wireless cell phone costs. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that actually has to do with calculation. So it isn't necessarily a reflection on demand or diminished demand. So I wouldn't take it to be as, as significantly negative. Um, our, our view is that we're going to see relatively tepid inflation this year. What about the stock market? Um, Dow at a record high. Are you still bullish on stocks? You're the global strategist, so if you had to choose where to allocate cash, where would that be? I would make sure we had a significant allocation outside the United States. I think what we've seen is this really significant rally since November. You know, America woke up on November 9th and realized, wow, after years of incredible um, um, uh, roadblocks in Washington, so little getting done. Now we have an executive and legislative branches that are of the same party. So much is going to get accomplished. And so there was a lot of optimism. Mm -hmm. I think that was largely driving stocks up. I mean, certainly er earnings improvement was part of the picture, but the bigger component was that optimism. And then, of course, reality sets in. Um, the legislative agenda doesn't seem to be um, as, uh, coming to fruition, at least not as, as, as expected. Yeah. And as quickly and as, with as much depth and breadth as expected. So if you would have a significant allocation outside of the United States, where would that be? Uh, European stocks and emerging market stocks. Um, there's a lot of potential in both for different reasons. Certainly emerging markets and European stocks both look uh, attractive valuation-wise relative to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we see significant growth in the emerging market space in a number of the countries. I wouldn't look at, uh, I wouldn't say collectively um, every country is deserving of, of investment dollars, but there are some very significant opportunities in the emerging market space. And the same is true for Europe, where we could see some macro catalysts. I think um, the European Union looks to be in better shape than it did just a few months ago. On that note, Christina Hooper, thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you. And Christina is with Invesco. She's the global market strategist there. Blue Cross Blue Shield will offer Affordable Care Act plans throughout the state of Michigan next year. The good news is that some areas that were in danger of having no options will have at least one option. The bad news is the insurer is requesting a significant rate increase and said those rates could go even higher, potentially rising about 30 percent if the Trump administration does not fund the cost-sharing payments. Separately, Aetna is leaving the door open to staying in Nevada's Obamacare exchange, but emphasizes that no final decision has been made. Last month, the insurer said it did not plan on participating in that program at all next year. 
And the deadline to file those proposed 2018 rates for individual insurance policies is coming up next week. And as Congress wrestles with long-term health reform legislation, insurers, state regulators, and patients have a more immediate concern about what might happen next year. Bertha Coombs has our story. All right, bring it up. For Mercedes Ibarra, getting insured under Obamacare was a godsend three years ago. She finally got treated for lupus, an autoimmune disease that nearly ended her ability to teach flamenco. The Affordable Care Act totally saved my life. This year, the Los Angeles dancer and her husband faced a financial setback, but she's able to afford coverage thanks to a premium tax credit and a cost-sharing reduction subsidy, which cuts her out-of-pocket costs. My specialist, who I do have to see once a month, my rheumatologist, uh, before the subsidy of $75 copay, and I'm now paying $16 when I see her. It's a huge difference, and it's a life-saving difference, because, again, if I didn't have access to health care right now, I wouldn't be able to do the things I do. But the fate of those cost-sharing subsidies is up in the air. With just one week until the deadline for insurers to submit rate requests for 2018 exchange plans, the Trump administration has not said whether it will continue to make those payments. Republican strategist Lindsey Beeler Greenleaf says there needs to be clarity. They view it as some sort of leverage going forward with these uh, Obamacare negotiations, the Obamacare repeal negotiations. That certainty lacking is certainly not helping shore up the exchanges. The uncertainty has pushed some insurers to pull out of the exchanges for 2018, but with the clock ticking, there's some movement. In Iowa, which could be left with no insurers next year, officials are asking the administration for a waiver and funding to prop up their exchange. And one of the large national exchange insurers, Centene, now says it will expand from six to nine states next year. So though we have these last minute exits that we have to worry about, there's there's also potential for for last minute expansion of these insurers that are already in the, the marketplace. A senior official at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, says they continue to work with states to try to provide greater flexibility on the exchanges. Mercedes Ibarra hopes that means funding the subsidy that keeps her on her feet. I don't want to go on disability. I want to be able to keep working. Bertha Coombs, Nightly Business Report. There was a message of unity today in Washington following a horrific attack in Northern Virginia. A gunman opened fire on a group of congressional Republicans during a morning baseball practice. Congressman Steve Scalise, the GOP's third-ranking House member, was injured, as were four others, before the shooter was killed by police. The alleged shooter has been identified as a 66-year-old man from Illinois who was reported to have volunteered for Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. I am sickened by this despicable act, and let me be as clear as I can be. Violence of any kind is unacceptable in our society, and I condemn this action in the strongest possible terms. We are united. We are united in our shock. We are united in our anguish, in attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. The president today also said that we are strongest when we are unified. Still ahead, gone missing. Why another business leader in China is nowhere to be found. Remember the large Chinese insurance company that purchased the Waldorf Astoria in New York? Well, the chairman of that company has mysteriously disappeared. Eunice Yoon reports tonight from Beijing.
The big question in the financial markets here today was where is Wu Xiaohui? We woke up this morning to Anbang, the Chinese insurance giant, issuing a statement saying that the chairman was no longer able to perform his duties for personal reasons. The company said that the management team was going to take over his responsibilities and that the day-to-day -day running of the company would be normal. But what wasn't so normal was that the statement came after local media reported that the chairman was taken away by authorities last Friday and that he hasn't been heard from since. Those stories have disappeared from the internet, but the news is raising questions about whether Anbang might be forced to sell off assets to meet obligations or demands of its policyholders. Ambang is seen as an aggressive investor overseas. It's probably best known for buying the Waldorf Astoria for $2 billion. In China, the chairman is most well known for being married to the granddaughter of former leader Deng Xiaoping. He's believed to be politically well-connected, and that's why the news sent a tremor throughout the insurance industry today. Stocks of Chinese insurers and Anbang-related companies dropped, and one industry insider told me that the government is trying to clean up the industry. Companies Companies such as Ambang have been offering insurance, but they resemble wealth management products, alternative investments that promise higher returns for investors rather than traditional insurance, which offers long-term protection for life and health. Anbang was heavily involved in these types of products, which some analysts believe is the reason why Anbang was able to raise so much money so fast. We still don't know whether or not Anbang's chairman's status has anything to do with this backdrop, but what we do know is that the government has been frowning upon this practice. For Nightly Business Reports, I'm Yunus Yoon in Beijing. Back here at home, Caterpillar hikes its dividend, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The heavy machinery maker raised its quarterly dividend more than 1 percent to 78 cents a share. The yield on that stock now sits at just under 3 percent. Shares of the Dow component fell nearly 1 percent to 104.71. The health insurer Anthem reaffirmed its prior forecast for the year, saying it still expects adjusted earnings to top $11.60 a share, but that is short of analyst expectations. Still, Anthem shares rose almost 1 percent to 188.77. The activist investor and hedge fund Elliott Management is urging BHP Billiton to shake up its board of directors. The mining company is set to vote on a new chairman this week, and Elliott says the new appointee should review and upgrade the board following years of poor management decisions. Shares of BHP Billiton were off more than 1.5 percent to $30.11. And SeaWorld shareholders have reportedly voted not to re-elect the company's chairman due to concerns over bonus payments that some company executives received. That's according to a Reuters report. The report added an official vote count hasn't been completed yet. SeaWorld shares jumped more than 6 percent to $17.07. The world's millionaires now own a very large percentage of global wealth. And according to a new report, that share is growing. Robert Frank has more. The world is getting wealthier, but more and more of that wealth is going to millionaires. Millionaire households who represent the richest 1% of the population now own a record 45% of all the personal wealth in the world. That's according to a new report from Boston Consulting Group. In all, the millionaires own about 75 trillion of the world's wealth, and it's just going to grow. By 2021, millionaires will own 51% of the world's wealth. Boston Consulting says rising stock markets, technological change that rewards highly skilled workers, and growing wealth creation in India, China, and other parts of Asia are driving the growing concentration of wealth. The rich will get richer, of course, but a lot of the wealth growth in the coming years will be newly created wealth. The number of millionaires will also grow. There are now nearly 18 million millionaire households in the world, and much of the new growth will come from Asia. Wealth in Asia expected to grow 61 percent by 2021, with North America growing by about half that. Wealth in China will nearly double. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. A new J.P. Morgan report says stock trading by machines is dominating Wall Street. The study found that only 10 percent of stock trading is regular stock picking. So what does that mean for you and the shrinking Wall Street pie? Jimmy Lee is CEO of the Wealth Consulting Group, and he joins us now to talk about that. Good to see you as always, Jimmy. Welcome back. Thanks, Sue. How are you? I'm good, thank you. What does this mean for the average investor, and do you buy into the thesis that it is a shrinking Wall Street pie? I don't at all. And for the average investor, I think it's important to understand that uh, 
you know, indexing strategy has been around a long time, and with the explosion of ETFs, that's why this has gotten much bigger. But I don't think fundamental analysis is dead. I don't think it'll ever go away. In fact, I'm going to take a contrarian view for active investors that if there's less people doing research for fundamental uh, gems out there, to find gems out there, I think that it will give opportunities for fundamental analysts to, to pick, find companies that uh, indexers will miss. Yeah, but for the average investor, is it smarter to index if you have a smaller, a larger percentage of the big guys buying the some of the individual stocks? Does it skew it for the individual investor? It seems like you don't think it does. You know, we, we offer both strategies, both passive and active. But, but we think that investors really, especially average investors, should have both. Um, you know, passive investment strategies work really well in bull markets. Active strategies tend to do better in down markets because the active managers can go to cash. Mm -hmm. And so instead of trying to guess which cycle of the market we're in, we think average investors should own both. What, what do you think is behind the fact that fewer companies have been going public um, and we have a lot of M and had a lot of M&A activity as well? How big a part of that is, is what they're calling the shrinking Wall Street pie? Well, I think that M&A uh, activity has a lot to do with it. But we've also had over the last decade a lot of companies uh, listing overseas. I think that has a lot to do with it as well. Um, also, companies that are taking longer or deciding to delist and maybe, maybe stay private. Uh, I also think regulation and the complexity and the cost of being a publicly traded company have all factored into why there's less publicly traded companies today than before. Well, I couldn't let you go if I didn't ask you where you see opportunity, whether through indexing or through stock picking. What are you watching? Well, we're watching a lot of different factors. Obviously, today we had interest rates move up uh, as expected, and the market really didn't react, right? So uh, we were not surprised by that. But we're looking at the, the continued growth in the U.S. economy, but also worldwide. We're having a recovery in Europe, and we think that we still have more room to run on the upside, Sue. All right. On that note, Jimmy Lee with the Wealth Consulting Group. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. And as we continue coming up, the future of airport security. It is a new 3D look inside your carry-on bags that could change how quickly you get through airport security. I'm Phil LeBeau, that story coming up on the Nightly Business Report. Here's a look at what to watch for tomorrow. The Philadelphia Federal Reserve will release its business outlook survey. We'll see if the labor market is still strengthening with the latest weekly jobless claims. And a fresh read on where home builder sentiment stands is out as well. That's what to watch for on Thursday. There is a new lawsuit that contends that Wells Fargo made unauthorized changes to home loans held by customers in bankruptcy, even as it was trying to recover from its fake accounts scandal. According to the New York Times, the changes typically lowered monthly loan payments, but the bank changed the term of the loan, in some cases by decades, thereby increasing the amount that borrowers ultimately owe the bank. Airline passenger complaints rose 70 percent in April. That report from the Department of Transportation comes after a series of high-profile incidents, including the forcible removal of a passenger from a United Airlines flight. The department received more than 1,900 complaints that month. American Airlines nixes its plan to lessen the legroom on some of its new planes. The company had said that it would not reduce the distance between some economy seats to make room for higher priced seats near the front. The airline had wanted to reduce the 30 inches of space to 29 inches, but reversed course after a wave of pushback. The Transportation Security Administration is testing new technology that could dramatically improve the cumbersome process of screening carry-on bags. It involves giving carry-ons a CT scan. Phil LeBeau shows us the new view of security that could change what happens when we go to the airport. Imagine going through airport screening without unpacking your bags or being stopped by TSA agents double-checking what's in your carry-on. Just outside of Boston, this machine, built by Analogic, could make carry-on screening go faster by giving TSA agents a clearer, 
3D view of your bag. It's designed to allow passengers to leave their liquids in their bag and their laptops, all the electronics stay in the bag and just drop and go. Essentially, analogic machines do a CAT scan of every bag that they see, producing a three-dimensional image that will detect weapons, but also potentially explosives that could be hidden in electronics, something the current two-dimensional x-ray machines may not always catch. It's one reason the U.S. and Great Britain currently ban passengers on certain flights from the Middle East from carrying laptop computers on board. But electronics bans could fade away thanks to new screening machines designed to pick up what TSA agents might miss. Most of them have automatic targeting. What, what that means is it's taking a lot of the human factor out of the equation. In other words, it's doing the targeting and identifying the threat uh, immediately for the screener, so the onus is not as much on the screener. With the number of people flying in the U.S. every year steadily climbing to an all-time high of just under 800 million passengers, the TSA is in a tough spot, forced to handle a growing number of travelers while keeping the lines moving as quick as possible. There's no more room for an airport to put security screening equipment. We need faster, more efficient equipment, and that's what, this is what this does. A view inside our bags that could make traveling safer and with far fewer security line headaches. Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, Peabody, Massachusetts. And before we go, here's a look at how the markets closed following the Fed's interest rate hike. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 46 points to 21,374. That's a record. The Nasdaq lost 25, and the S&P 500 was off, too. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.